I'm Nikki. And I'm Jess. She's the traumatized. And she's the abandoned. And welcome, welcome to, to our, our podcast. podcast. Where we talk about true crime, spooky things, and everything in between. And today, we're going to be going over natural disasters. Which we were just saying how not how not excited excited we were. Mm hmm because it's intriguing like i'm going over, i'm so i'm see i was saying i'm really excited to say i'm not excited but it's like it's really interesting so mm. but yeah so how was your week it was better i am less sick i still Yay! have a tiny cough but and then we got some news which mm -hmm. is really good news but will be mm -hmm. shared at a later time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then yeah so it's been an eventful week in the comments what do you think your news is <laughs> we're you moving no yeah oh my god imagine, no, imagine. That's, <laughs> that's that's me this year is gonna be a big year for both of us it is lots of lots of changes are happening and we're here we're glad you guys are here for the ride yeah it's gonna be a good one so yeah, how is your week? <laughs> <laughs> I like how this is the thing that like, you are you are like nervous to ask me how my week is now because it's like, uh, <laughs> we're here. Uh, I'm so interested because you sent me that thing about like the four moon cycle it was really interesting because literally it was like three things like back to back to back and I was like what the hell is happening in, in this world. Mm -hmm. like i can't take this and then you sent me that tiktok and you're like oh the, the, i guess there was a four full moon cycle so if you guys well this is gonna come out in two weeks if you guys were experiencing anything the week of like the week before valentine's day mm -hmm. me too but yeah no let's see i i packed a box that was exciting mm -hmm. got my first box packed made and packed so i'm gonna do another one today i'm just gonna start packing a box a day Yes. eventually because i have i'm moving in a couple weeks all good things i'm training the person at work and that's going really well that's good uh <laughs> trying to focus on positive things right now and it's really hard uh, <laughs> the new hogwarts game came out that's mm -hmm. exciting it was playing that that's bad no i got <laughs> great so today's topics <laughs> <laughs> or no fun fact of the day yeah you just skip over my fun Sorry. fact all the time it's okay it's actually kind of fun it goes along with what we're talking about mm. so you already knew that the earth has earthquakes but did you know the moon has moonquakes tidal distress caused by the distance between the earth and the moon will cause these tremors Interesting. and like literally the moon will have moonquakes wow yeah crazy right that even the moon lift does a little shimmy shake anyway a little shimmy shake <laughs> yeah <laughs> love that <laughs> i'm in a mood today all right what are you talking about what is your topic? so i am talking about the great blizzard of 1888 Ooh. okay okay so a little overview, the Great Blizzard of 1888, also known as the Great Blizzard of 88, or the Great White Hurricane. Ooh. It was okay. one of the most severe recorded blizzards in American history. Snow fell from 10 inches to 58 inches in some parts. 58 inches. Wow. How many, how much, do the math? Almost five feet. Almost five feet. Yeah. Wow. Holy crap. The storm paralyzed the East Coast from the Chesapeake Bay to Maine. It was the deadliest, snowiest, and most unusual winter storm in American records. Mm -hmm. Over 400 perished, including wow. 200 alone in New York City. Holy hell. That's mm. So, we're going to go into the fact of kind of like that winter in in general so we're kind of like backing it up now mm -hmm. so the january of 1888 saw the most intense cold wave on record in northwestern portions of the country so now mm -hmm. we're talking about like the northwestern part mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this then spread to the east during the third week of the month bringing additional all-time cold records to the upper midwest Mm. So I have some examples. It was negative six at Roseburg, Oregon on January 16th. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. negative 36 at Eli or Ellie, Nevada in January 16th. Mm -hmm. And in St. Paul, Minneapolis, Minnesota on January 21st, it was negative 41 degrees. You just don't go outside. You just don't you just go outside where your power doesn't go off. Don't like go that's off. that's like the day after tomorrow kind of <laughs> shit. Like well, also a polar this is vortex. Like, this is like the 1880s. So yeah. it's basically just like a bunch of pioneers. Like Jesus, well, that's type why stuff. it murdered so many people. It's so cold. Yeah, the cold wave was preceded by a phenomenal blizzard in the upper plains in the Midwest. So basically, there were two blizzards. There was one in the Midwest, and then there's the one in the East that I'm going to talk about later. So this first blizzard was known as the Children's Blizzard, and the storm led to the deaths of some 200 to 250 settlers from exposure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's fucking freezing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The blizzard was... This blizzard, the Children's Blizzard, was considered one of the deadliest... That is until the Great Blizzard, which came directly after it. Oh, shit. So they just got hit like bam, bam. Mm hmm. Damn. Okay. So the Blizzard of 88, or the Great Blizzard, was unique and odd for several reasons. Mm-hmm. Firstly, most severe storms that affect the Northeast are preceded by an outbreak of cold air. But. Yep. Before this storm, the weather was actually described as unseasonably mild so like Hmm. there was no cold front before this blizzard came in interesting okay secondly the storm center became stationary and actually made a counterclockwise loop off of the coast of southern new england while maintaining its peak intensity so it basically looked like a hurricane that's why it's called great hurricane Oh my god, yeah, it did a loop. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. It did its little loop off the the coast there, and then it eventually just drifted off to sea and dissipated. Okay. For this story, we're mainly going to be talking about the effects the storm had on New York City, but there are a few times where I kind of go outside of New York City, so just yeah. we'll be bouncing back and forth. But in New York City, the rain turned to snow at 1 a.m. on Monday, March 12th, when the temperature began to fall to freezing. Blizzard conditions quickly developed as the wind rose to a sustained 50 miles per hour. 50, 5-0? Wow, okay. By 8 a.m. Monday, the city was completely immobilized by the blinding, drifting, and at- Drifting snow and howling winds. Mm -hmm. The elevated rail line in the city ground to a halt, especially when one train derailed and crashed below, killing several passengers and crew. Oh, wow. Needless to say, transportation was a standstill inside New York City and outside. Yeah. Like I said, so we're going to go outside a little bit. It was said in... One source that 75 trains across the whole area became stuck in the snow or crashed along the northeast area. How many? 70? 75. Wow. The storm was even more severe in areas north and east of New York City. 50 trains alone became stranded between Albany and the city, as well as Long Island in New Jersey and Connecticut. Many derailed after trying to plow through drifts measured up to 38 feet. Jeez, I can't even imagine. Right? Like, like I had to double check all the numbers because right, that's insane. Snow drifts up to 40 feet were reported in Bongal, a small town in New York. Like, yeah, because those snow drifts are like, yeah, I mean, they, they, the wind blows them up and they'll literally like go up buildings and shit like that. Like, like it's crazy. Insane. Uh huh. Many of the 200 fatalities attributed to the blizzard outside of New York City consisted of passengers and train crews that attempted to walk to nearby towns after their trains became stalled or derailed, wow. which is a no-no. If any of you from are from like a snowy place, like, you know, do not get out of your vehicle whatsoever during a blizzard. You will not make it. You must stay in your vehicle. 
I know several people who have lost their lives because they didn't stay in their vehicle. It's insane. So back in New York City, walking the streets became not only impossible, but deadly. Of the 200 people who perished in New York City, most were found buried in snowdrifts along the city's sidewalks. Mm. Wow. Refugees filled all the hotels. The Astor Hotel set up a hundred cots in its lobby when it became apparent by sunset that day that venturing outside was still impossible. Wow. The temperature had fallen to eight degrees Fahrenheit by sunset and the wind was still howling and snow drifts up to 20 feet filled the streets of the city. <sighs> Holy hell. And like we're talking about a, like a, a packed city where yeah. like not a lot of like wind can really like blow through yeah. it very well yeah. so like uh-huh. that's insane <laughs> like literally insane holy crap at the time new york city had an extensive amount of electrical wires suspended above ground throughout the city and virtually mm-hmm. all electrical lines were brought down by the weight of the immense ice and snow and this is you said this is new york city right yeah so a fun fact all that all those wiring now and i I might be cutting into your, but whatever. Am I? You can say what you want to say. Everything's underground now. They don't have any wires like that above ground anymore. It's I all wonder why. Oh, interesting. Okay. I didn't never do why. So <laughs> I found it really interesting. Like in the city, there's no overhead, like any kind of wiring or anything. Yeah. One <laughs> article said that the lines would go down and then the continuous snowfall would bury the lines. <gasps> Those walking home would be electrocuted when stepping on recently buried lines. Holy shit. Well, that's a new fear. Yeah. Unlocked. <laughs> well, it's not going to happen now. But. That's true. <laughs> the down power lines are also said to have caused many fires in the city that the fire departments obviously could not reach. Right. Right. So property loss from fire alone was estimated at 25 million, which is equivalent mm-hmm. to today's money of 750 million dollars. Damn. This also meant that the telegraph lines went down. Mhm. So there was absolutely no communication nor traveling going in or out of New York City. Okay. Unfortunately, the intensity of the snow and the blowing of the snow buried many of the fallen and the bodies weren't found until up to a week later once the snow wow. melted. Oh, once it melted because it takes so long for that shit to melt. Holy hell. Several ships floundered at sea as well, oh, yeah. lost to 90 mile an hour winds, huge seas and ice accumulations on the deck that would cause the ships to roll over due to being top heavy. Wow. Now we're going to talk about kind of like how much snow was like okay. accumulated. The max accumulation from the storm was 58 inches, and that was at Saratoga Springs, north of Albany, New York. Yep, yep, yep. Albany had 47 inches. New York City Central Park had 21 inches. Brooklyn mm. and Queens had up to 36 in- oh inches. My God. <laughs> There's it, it was but people don't I don't think people realize and again I'm sorry if I'm cutting into something you might say. No. But there's nowhere for that snow to go. And it's the only no, no there there's not. There's nowhere no. for it to go because in in Queens and Brooklyn and in the city, it's just streets and buildings. Like there's nowhere to pilot. You mm-hmm. basically the only the place what they do with it is they either try to melt it or they throw it in the Hudson. <laughs> and because there's literally nowhere else like they'll literally put the snow in trucks take it to the river and dump it in the river because there's nowhere for it to go like it's wild new haven connecticut was 42 inches so along with all that snow there were the snow drifts that ranged from 30 to 40 feet high the storm's winds were also intense like I said earlier, when gusts up to 80 miles per hour were reported in New York City, it was reported that wind gusts were 40 miles per hour. Mm. So, like, trying to imagine just trying to walk somewhere no. during this. Insane. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't walk anywhere. Please don't. <laughs> and on March 13th, New York City, so this is would be kind of like the day after the blizzard, because the blizzard started on the 12th, so... Kind of like right. today. March 13th, New York City temperatures were recorded at 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So now we're going to talk about the impact. Unless you had something okay. else to say. No, I was just thinking to myself. I was like, when I talk about melting it, they would they would literally have like trucks with like heaters on them now. Mm. That's not a thing in, in 1888. They were in horses and buggies. Yeah, that's not a thing. There's nowhere for that snow to go. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I was like, six degree weather's not going to melt it either. <laughs> like, damn. S- so the first thing that I'm going to kind of talk about, the blizzard was the first widely photographed natural disaster in U- U.S. history. And that's why I have so many pictures of it. I noticed. I was actually Isn't really impressed because you so said it was cool. so old. Yeah. yeah. And like there's so many pictures. I love it. The deadly Highline rail disaster led the city of New York to plan its vast subway system, now one of the hey. most extensive in the world. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. The breakdown of all communications from Washington, D.C. northward resulted in the burying of the telegraph and later electrical lines across many parts of the mid-Atlantic and northeast hey. regions. There we go. And this also prompted an extensive renovation of Grand Central Depot, or what we call it now today, Grand Central Station. Yeah, that place. Have you ever been to Grand Central? No. Oh, it's really pretty. I think I've been it's, to it's JFK Airport. I think we flew from Minneapolis to JFK to Paris. I think yes. that's what we did. Yeah. So. But I've JFK been in New York, even- but not really. <laughs> Any hole to finish mm-hmm. off my little story. I have some personal stories. Oh, I'm so ready. So this is from a letter dated March 14th, 1888. And all I know is he's called Mr. Spire. So, okay. or Spire. And he wrote, on Monday, March 12th, I could not get down town at all i was on an elevated train that collided with another and for a few moments we thought everything was over for us then some ladders were brought along and we climbed down the street and there is a picture of that somewhere i just n- that's not one of the ones that i picked mm-hmm. but you could see like they had ladders up on the on the railway system for people to mm-hmm, climb down mm-hmm. from the trains that were stuck so this next one is an account written by A.C. Chadbourne. He left Boston on midnight on a midnight train Sunday, March 11th for New York, accompanied by a young man, then my partner in business. The weather had been mild and I was attired in a cutaway coat, patent leather shoes, lightweight top coat, and a oh, proverbial nice. high silk hat, which all the all young men wore at that period. I woke up at 7 a.m. Imagine my surprise when I look out the car window and found the train had was stalled in deep snow at about 127th Street, and that the whole city was blanketed with snow piled in every direction. I got out of the car door and saw a line of cars and trains stalled ahead of me as far as one could see down the tracks. So because they saw the all the stall, basically, they decided to walk. So mm. I kind of like skipped the lengthy part of them walking or whatever. But right, right, right. Okay. So they get to a place and he then says, our condition only warranted a few moments stay until we could catch our breath and start across Broadway down to 38th Street. I distinctly remember being blown down twice while crossing Broadway and crawling through the snow on my hands and knees up to the west sidewalk of Broadway. At last, our destination was reached, and I calculated that we had walked at the rate of a little less than one mile an hour from the time that we had left the train. Yeah, because I mean... I mean, I've never been in the city in those kind of conditions, but that wind whips through mm-hmm. those buildings so bad. So I can only imagine yeah, how quick it was getting. Yeah. So this next one is uh, an account written by Mr. A.A. A. Simonson. Mr. Simonson's home was on Staten Island. He made two attempts to reach it. When he tried on Wednesday, he found that the ferry boats were not running. On Thursday, however, they were moving again. I crossed the Grand Street Ferry to New York and I took South Street Belts Line, horse cars, or South Ferry. Mm -hmm. When we got to the Collier's Slip, we saw people walking across the East River to Brooklyn. Mm. So out I got and after paying 250 to go down a ladder, I got on the ice and walked to Brooklyn and back. So like the river was like... It wasn't, I don't think it was frozen over, but a lot of, it was like a bunch of ice chunks that were like stuck together. 
So yeah. people were just walking across the river to get to Brooklyn and back. I mean, it could have been frozen. It could have been frozen. It over. could have been and frozen those temperatures, over. Temperatures, and those temperatures, like the the Hudson does freeze over, and uh, even up here, they use it for barges and stuff. They'll actually have an icebreaker go through if the if the winter is cold enough. There have been a couple of years where they have to have an icebreaker go through and break down the middle, mm-hmm. so that to, so it does freeze over. So it very well could have. And then there's just I couldn't find these stories again, but they're ones that I remember. So I remember a story of a man who was walking home and he was so exhausted. He fell asleep like while leaning on a post like he was just going to lean on a post to rest. You can't fall asleep in the cold. But miraculously, he he was able to wake up and made his way home. Somehow he survived. Holy shit. Like insane. That's so lucky. And then the other last one, another story spoke of a man walking and he like tripped or fell or slipped or whatever, fell into a like a snow drift and hit his head on something hard. And it turns out it was like from a horseshoe from a horse that had like <gasps> passed and was oh, buried no! by the snow. Yeah. Oh, no. But that mm. is the blizzard of 1888. Oh, wow. Wow. I've never heard of that. Right. No, never. It's insane. Oh my god. And I love how many pictures I could get from it. I do too. I was not when you said nineteen eight or eighteen sorry, I keep saying nineteen eighty eight. Eighteen eighty eight, I was thinking, oh okay, it's just gonna be like because I did the molasses thing mm-hmm. was like in the in the like deep past too, and I was just like it was really hard to find pictures. That's really cool. What are you speaking about today? Are you ready? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) I am going to be talking about the Joplin, Missouri tornado. Mm. Have you heard of this? I think I heard of it. I don't know what it entails. Okay. So I'm going to break it down. What happened during this tornado? Are you ready? Yes. This is story time. So buckle up. Get some popcorn. Get settled. Okay. At 534 p.m., On May 22nd, 2011, a tornado touched down on the western edge of the city limits of Joplin. The touchdown occurred near the junction of JJ Highway and West 32nd Street. At this point, the tornado toppled over several large trees. Spotter reports noted multiple vortexes rotating around the parent circulation near the beginning of the tornado. Wait, do you say multiple? Oh, dear. Okay. The tornado quickly intensified as it it tracked to the east-northeast. It then quickly widened and increased its intensity as it entered Joplin city limits. Numerous homes, businesses, and vehicles were destroyed as it approached St. John's Medical Center. St. John's took a direct hit. No. Interior walls, ceilings sustained several severe damage inside the medical center. And the parking lot concrete parking stops rebarred into the asphalt were lifted and tossed. Large steel support beams were curved, twisted, and distorted. Debris piling was evident with vehicles being crushed, flattened, and wrapped around trees. As the tornado continued along its path, it reached peak intensity and was roughly a mile wide. That's insane. St. Mary's Catholic Church was nearly leveled as the tornado tracked to the east-northeast. The only portions of the church remaining were the steel cross and a portion of metal roof. Neighborhoods east of McLend Boulevard became unrecognizable as homes were swept from their foundations. The tornado roared on as it crossed 25th Street and South Main Street. The destruction continued at Joplin High School, where sections of the building were completely destroyed. A school bus was tossed on top of the destroyed bus garage. What? Yeah. (laughs) Surrounding businesses and homes and buildings were completely destroyed. Many open fields were covered with boards, tree limbs, steel beams, fencing, and other materials embedded deeply into the ground. So they lifted and like shuttered the ground. The tornado continued its destructive path as it approached the main business sections along Range Line Road. Several well-constructed buildings were destroyed, including Academy Sports, Walmart, Home Depot, and the Pepsi Distribution Center and the Cummings Generator Building. The raw power of the tornado scored asphalt parking lots, mangled steel structures, and crushed vehicles. 
As the potato tracked east, it slowly weakened in intensity and had shrunk down to a half mile wide. Despite weakening, the tornado destroyed East Middle School along East 20, 20th Street. Numerous warehouse style buildings and many homes suffered moderate to severe damage. Uh, it then turned right and moved southeast. The tornado crossed Interstate 44 near the junction of 249 and Interstate 44. Cars and trucks were blown off the interstate. Jeez. Highway signs became mangled pieces of metal. The tornado then weakened in intensity, crossed Interstate 44. It continued to weaken and lifted about 4.8 miles of Grammy, Missouri. The tornado damaged homes, mobile homes, outbuildings, and toppled trees before lifting. Wow. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. This is it taking form. Oh, good floor. Oh. oh, it's huge right away. Keep your camera straight. You need this. Like you can see there too, there's multiple like there's multiple fingers like reaching down. Like it's right. like like even on the outsides of the main one, it's literally like the cloud is the clouds are literally dropping. <laughs> yeah. And how fucking fast it formed was insane. Also, I said simultaneously, like, I simultaneously want to do this. I, I would love to fucking chase a trainer, but I would never fucking do this. Like, like, it's crossing the fucking road. Like, that's. There it is. Oh, it is huge. Like, again, simultaneously, love to do this, but also. There's people that have a profession of doing this. Yeah, like, well, that's what these they are. That's what these people are. <clears throat> the impact. Mm -hmm. The natural disaster shook southwest Missouri, placing the region in a worldwide spotlight. This tornado led to 161 deaths, more than 1,300 injuries, and nearly $3 billion worth of damage. Jesus. To date, the May 22nd, 2011 tornado is considered the most costliest tornado in the united states history wow the twister ravaged nearly through one third of joplin city limits reaching peak speeds of more than 200 miles per hour no no you're lying mm -mm. <laughs> it covered 22 miles of ground in jasper and newton counties in over 38 minutes wow now, that wasn't the first time violent tornadoes had rolled through the region. Two twisters hit Joplin in the early 1970s, and it contributing to four deaths and more than 100 injuries. And then a storm system from 1973 produced gusts up to 100 miles per hour, causing $20 million in property damage at the time, according to the historic Joplin report that they put out in June of 2011. You know, Joplin is considered to be just on the outskirts of Tornado Alley, which is a region in central United States known to produce frequent tornadoes from late spring to early fall, which like I think it's crazy if we do have like people, anybody on the outside of the country listening. Like our our country has a tornado alley. Like that's terrifying. I, I don't think we might be in it. I think you are. I think you but, are. But like we've been getting tornadoes in December recently. Ooh, like last well, year, this yeah. year, like insane the 2011 twister not only embodied 
characteristics of Tornado Alley region, but carried them out to an ex- extent rarely seen in the Midwest. Fewer than 1% of all tornadoes reach F5 status, while even fewer of those strike populated areas like Joplin. And that was according to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. But obviously, this was an F5. Mm. Did they have warning? No. The National Weather Service projected the potential for severe weather system in two days in advance. So, issuing an alert for hazardous weather outlook on May 20th, 2011. Two days later, the National Weather Service issued a tornado watch around 1.30 p.m. Central Time, indicating conditions were favorable for tornadoes in Missouri and three neighboring states. Cold fronts had clashed with warm fronts throughout the afternoon. Meteorologists tracked the supercell thunderstorm forming between southeast Kansas and southwest Missouri, though it wasn't exactly clear what the storm system would bring into the early evening. At one point, there were five or six storms all capable of producing tornadoes or ones that produced a tornado over the southeast Kansas. And that's a KY3 chief meteorologist, John Hurst, who was covering this. Two thunderstorms eventually merged just west of Joplin and began producing the mega tornado. Just like a perfect storm kind of thing. Yeah. So fast forward several hours, storm chasers and spotters reported multiple vortices just west of Joplin city limits. After communicating with emergency officials, the National Weather Service forecast office in Springfield issued a tornado warning for Joplin and neighboring communities at 5.17 p.m. This provided residents with at least 17 minutes of lead time in advance of the tornado, according to the National Weather Service. So... Which is insane. They got 17 minutes. Like, with tornadoes, they are so unpredictable. Yeah. Like, I know we had a warning recently, a couple of weeks ago, so I was up all night, like, watching, like, listening for the sirens, because, yeah. like, so you scary. never know. And, like, after living on the East Coast and coming back to the West Coast, I'd rather deal with a hurricane. Like, I can sit on the computer and watch where the hurricane is going to hit. It's going to hit us. Right. All right, let's get out. With a tornado, there's no such thing as that. You can't watch it progress no. and decide no, where it's going. So, mm-hmm. it's... an I hate tornadoes. So uh, National Weather Service reported that the tornado hit initially at 5.54 p.m. on the western edge of Joplin. It formed near the junction, like I said, of State Highway JJ and West 32nd Street. It intensified in catastrophic levels when it officially reached the Joplin city limits at 5.41 Generations braved the storm for more than half an hour before it weekend. It dissipated around 612 near the city of Granby, Missouri. Officials reported 116 deaths from the tornado just one day after it hit. Per federal records, the death toll eventually grew to 161 in the long weeks and months that followed as they were cleaning the wreckage. Mm-hmm. The National Weather Service and Federal Emergency Management Agency have also noted these impacts in various reports. So, numbers. 1,371 injuries ranging from abrasions, lacerations, broken bones, and dismemberment. Ooh. Okay. 4,380 homes were destroyed, and another 3,884 were significantly damaged. So, a total of 8,264 homes had been impacted. Wow. 553 businesses' structures were destroyed or damaged. 3 million cubic yards of debris have been scattered. And there were 130 transmission poles that were damaged, which obviously contributed to lengthy power outages. Mm -hmm. The tornado ripped through a considerable stretch of Joplin, wiping out nearly one-third of the flagship city for Missouri's fourth-largest metropolitan city. And this was a quote. Most tornadoes leave a narrow strip of torn up lives. You might see a destroyed homes on one side of a street, untouched homes on the other. But in Joplin, you could stand in one spot and do a full turn and only see damage. Mm. And now I'm going to show you the other video. <laughs> so uh, buckle up. Okay. <laughs> 
and you can see all the damage here. We're told that's the hospital. This hospital is being evacuated. Since we arrived into town, we've seen oh dozens God. of law enforcement agencies from the surrounding states coming in to help evacuate these patients. We have also heard reports that some of the debris from the hospital has reached areas like Willard. A woman was reportedly seeing an x-ray, uh, x-rays in her front yard, and that just gives you a visual to how far this damage is reaching. But if you think this is bad, mm. check out this over here. This is a neighborhood that is completely flattened. By what neighborhood window. is there gone? There is no neighborhood. Walking up and down the street. Trying Wait. Trying to figure out if their loved ones are alive, if they're injured. There is no power here right now. And uh, these people are just basically walking around. Um, like literally, what like. And what happens so quickly. Um, from what, I told, what I'm told, dozens of homes are right here. And I can't even pick out a single one of them. We we're told that the mayor of Joplin has declared this a disaster area. And he is also asking for all the people that work here in the city, if they can, to come into work to help figure out and survey the damage here. And of course, we'll have the latest on the situation on Renewed. Wow. Just a pole bent in half. <laughs> like, so wild. Joplin is trying to regain its footing as well as ride out another Oklahoma storm tornado of big value to in the doorway. Yeah, right there. At that door. We was hanging on to that door. That screen door. And uh, outside. Outside. The Vasquez family had just come home from Joplin High School's graduation when the tornado hit on their front porch. We were trying to get out. Tyler busted the door open. That's my brother over there. He busted the door open. We were getting hit by debris and stuff. I got cuts everywhere. They tried sucking us out. Uh -huh. I mean, it was trying to lift our feet up and stuff. And then when we looked up, the whole roof just, man, it was gone. So when everything went, poof, I just hunkered down. Like that. What are you supposed to do, guys? I held onto the seat like this. I came back up to try and get him. It, it took me everything I had to leave him there. We actually thought that the, the wind took him, the tornado took him, because he couldn't get out of the van. We are standing right now in front of the Home Depot and the Walmart. What? Both Home Depot and Walmart. Where's Home Depot? Depot? But not the case. Doesn't anymore. exist. Uh, this is as far as our cameras can go. We know right now that they are in recovery mode, according to police who are out here, uh, basically using bulldozers to try to dig through the rubble. We heard a lot about Home Depot and Walmart right when the storm rolled through. We know that there were definitely um, a lot of shoppers inside both of those buildings. We cannot give you any exact numbers Not even right that. Now. People probably uh, ran there for cover. This is as close as they're letting Because uh, the tornado is not going to destroy right a steel we building. We one associate, mm -mm. Uh, unfortunately, who lost her life during the... Uh, during the storm in the store. Home Depot isn't releasing that employee's name, but they say he is a hero who mm -hmm. was trying to quickly move people to the safest part of this concrete and still building. It was you know, really an effort to make sure to get everybody into the part of the store. We do have an emergency preparedness plan. Uh, and from what we understand, there were some great heroes in the store that followed that plan and were able to get a lot of folks uh, to safety. Three days later, authorities are calling their mission recovery, but there's still hope for rescue. So you may bring in heavy equipment uh, to get into a building. This was and this was weeks after. Still may be using uh, uh, there's a couple different videos in here. Building. Mm -hmm. Homes are seriously damaged in this neighborhood. You can see debris is everywhere. There's shingles right here. I'm going to be careful, but you can see wood is all around here too. Check out this person's car. You can check out the damage right there and what this tornado <laughs> did to this area and all the devastation here. We did talk to Red Cross officials. They are in the process of setting up shelters all throughout the Joplin area to help those that need it most. They're giving out basic items like food, water, and yeah. shelter. So now we're going to go to the rescue. Mm -hmm. So on May 23rd, 2011, one day after the storm, FEMA issued an amendment to offer critical emergency needs for Jasper and Newton counties, including emergency protective measures funding. Former Missouri Governor Jay Nixon also took swift action, activating the Missouri National Guard for debris removal, signing executive 
orders to support Joplin's recovery efforts. Within 24 hours of the tornado, more than 800 police cars, 300 ambulances, 400 fire trucks, and 1,100 emergency responders arrived to assist with tornado response. Insane. More than 400 publicly, public safety agencies from at least five neighboring states made their way to provide mutual aid, according to FEMA. More than 13 federal agencies and 820 FEMA employees helped with Joplin's response and recovery efforts at peak staffing. Then standing, President Barack Obama traveled to Joplin later in May to visit some of the hardest hit areas and meet with several survivors. As more help arrived, efforts turned to cleaning up Joplin and searching for survivors. That, that to me, is crazy because they were like, ugh. One day after the tornado hit, authorities rescued 17 people who were trapped under debris. Like, can you imagine being just trapped? No. For, like, 24 hours? Like, yeah. The Joplin Globe reports some were found nearby their homes, while others were found by businesses such as Home Depot. Mm -hmm. Tens of thousands of volunteer organizations fulfilled various tasks to help the Joplin community move forward. And as of early May 2021... The city reported at least 180,000 volunteers had dedicated more than 1.5 million hours of service in tornado response efforts. Wow. That's that's amazing. Like yeah. the effort that everyone. Right. Rebuilding recovery and costs. The Twister not only destroyed thousands of homes, but several community landmarks and notable buildings that offered essential services. Some of the hardest sites include... First, we're going to talk about St. John's uh, Regional Medical Center, which we kind of saw in the video. Mm -hmm. Mercy's medical site in Joplin suffered extensive damage, ranging from busted windows and interior walls to piles of debris in the parking lot. Hundreds of staff and patients were inside the hospital when it took the direct hit. The hospital, which opened up in 1896, lost power while the tornado ripped through Joplin. Five patients died in the aftermath while surviving patients were sent to Mercy's Hospital in Springfield and Northwest Arkansas for treatment. Mercy demolished the St. John's Regional Medical Center in 2013 and opened its new location along Interstate 44 in 2015. Joplin High School, where they said the oh graduation God. was taking place. Yeah. The Twister blew through 10 schools in Joplin School District. Six of them, including Joplin High School, were considered a total loss. From ripped off roots to flattened support structures, the tornado wiped out many sections of the high school. Open fields and parking lots were covered by piles of boards, limbs, steel beams, fencing, and other materials. The Joplin School District notes the storm caused financial damages of more than $1 million to its schools. The high school had also held its graduation ceremony for the 2001 class at the Missouri State University just a few hours before the tragedy struck. St. Mary's Catholic Church nearly leveled upon impact. St. Mary's Catholic Church may have taken a hard hit while the tornado taken the hardest hit while the tornado reached near peak intensity. The church was located a few blocks away from St. John's Regional Medical Center and very little of it remained standing after the storm ripped through it. Perhaps symbolic of hope through the tragedy, a steel cross stayed put in its original spot. The Joplin Globe reports that the cross had been preserved while St. Mary's was able to re was able to open a new church location in, in 2014. Mm -hmm. So the range line road businesses that we had mentioned before, many business owners lost their stores from the Twister, either temporarily or permanently. Dozens of retailers along Range Line Road, a busy commercial section, were faced with a challenging decision on whether to rebuild or move out. Businesses such as Academy Sports, Home Depot, and Walmart ended up with notable damage. The storm system even powered through larger sites such as the Pepsi Distribution Center and Cummings Generator Building. More than 80% of businesses damaged by the storms have since rebuilt and reopened per the city records. So the net result was $2.8 billion in losses citywide due to tornado damage. And according to the federal records, the Joplin tornado is the costliest on record and one of only three in the United States history to exceed $2 billion in adjusted value losses. Wow. And that is the story of the T Joplin tornado. Insane. Yeah. So that was Joplin. The last picture I sent you, the Joplin high school, how they had written like hope because the 
the J and the yeah. L I N. They wrote hope there. I thought that was really cool. That crazy. Yeah. Wild. So wild. So yeah, guys, that's that's it for this episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, please don't forget to follow. Leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube. Hi. Make sure to like and subscribe. We love new friends. So be a new friend for us. Mm-hmm. You know, say hi. And if you want to see the videos that we included in our podcast, it'll be on the, oh, yeah. on the YouTube page. Because there were That's videos true. in this one. Yeah, there's videos in this one. We also put pictures. Uh, Nikki posts pictures uh, in our stories, too. She re- works really hard to put those in there. So. Plus, I you mean, can see really our beautiful hard. faces. <laughs> and uh, you can see our faces and our expressions, which is... Sometimes they're, they're entertaining. They are. <laughs> You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok with our username at TTATA Podcast. In our bios is a link to our link tree, which has our email. If you have any suggestions, comments, concerns, topic ideas, hit us up. Let us know. Please and thank you. Yeah, do it. <laughs> we want we want emails from you guys. It'd be fun. Thanks for listening. Next week we are going to be covering true crime. Jess's so favorite. Excited. It is my favorite. It's my favorite. We were talking about like all the different topics. I think I have like five true crime stories lined up. I have so many. I have so many. <laughs> I want to tell you guys all about the true crime. Um, I like true crime and abandoned places. Or not yeah, spooky things. Spooky yeah, I really like And with that, we're going to leave you with this inspirational quote. <laughs> if you don't like the road you're walking, start paving another one by Dolly Parton. Mm hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. You got this. Mm-hmm. One step at a time. <laughs> not gonna cry. My Sorry. eyes are not getting blurry. It's fine. All right. Love you guys. <laughs> I'm just gonna say if you're if a tornado's coming, hide in your basement, cellar, whatever mm-hmm. you got. If you're stuck in a blizzard, stay in your vehicle or stay in in a building. Do not leave wherever you are because you might get, and that not only that but like side note this is really far behind but you could get lost because you get there's whiteout mm-hmm. conditions so you just can't see where you are so yeah. it's very disorienting if you live where there's blizzards also have like a blizzard kit with blankets and and in your car granolas yep yep uh-huh uh-huh bottled yep. water mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. stay right. safe out there stay safe keep warm keep pushing on all right bye, bye guys bye. <laughs>